I'm hitting the record button right now, bringing up my questions. Are you good to go? You ready to go? Oh, yeah. All right. Hi, friends. What's going on? Pedro here. And Dizzy. And we have the man himself uh, kind of responsible for for the the modern uh, relay of information regarding hash, responsible for bringing us uh, a modern bubble bags, uh, Marcus, BC Bubble Man. How the heck are you, my friend? I'm doing really good, man. Thanks, uh, both of you, for having me on the show, and uh, yeah, I look forward to a nice conversation today. Ridiculously happy to have you on. Yes. Um, Thank I you mean, for coming. Being a being a hash maker myself, um, the respect that I have for you is is through the roof. So. So having you on is uh, is monumental. I'm sure, I'm sure people from the from my uh, audience will be will be greatly impressed to see you on here, and uh, and it'll be fun and for fun fun conversation. Hopefully, um, usually the way I start off the show just to get the get the juices flowing and whatnot. It seems to be a good starting starting question for for the show is uh, y- your first experience. Your your when were you kind of introduced to cannabis um, and maybe your first smoking or, or however, whatever experience took place? Yeah, you know, I've told the story a few times, but not too, too many. So, you know, probably a lot of the people won't have heard it, but I was, I was 14 years old. Um, at that point in my life, I was very much into like organized sports. I liked the discipline of it. I liked the team, teamwork. I was like into hockey growing up in the prairies. There wasn't much else to do in the eight-month winter that we uh, were exposed to. Uh, so, I, you know, uh, one of my hockey player friends, and just one, because I'll tell you, all of the rest of them, it was a, it was a high level of hockey, so it was, it was Tier 1 and Tier 2 that you actually had to try out for and make ah, those teams. And sure, sure. Tier, tier 3 and Tier 4, you just kind of showed up and signed up your name and you could play. And so it became this, you know, for us at that age to try and become a part of this team, it was quite serious. You had to work out. We were playing hockey at 5 a.m. before school started. And wow. so, no, and, and this was during a time, I mean, my God, what was the year? It would have been 1980 something, 85 or 86, maybe 87. Uh, so cannabis was like super no-no in the Bible Belt of, of Winnipeg, Manitoba. So, you know, lo and behold, one of my buddies who's a helicopter pilot nowadays, Steve McAvoy, um, he came up to me at one point and was like, hey, I've got a joint. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, whoa, a joint, like, okay, well, that's, uh, that's, that's something. So what do you, what do you, <laughs> so we make the, we make the plan. Okay. We're going to have a sleepover. We're going to go skateboarding, uh, down the street from my mom's house. Like, you know, later on at night, like eight or nine o'clock Sure. and we're going to go smoke this joint. So we end up going about a block down from my mom's house and smoke this joint next to a BFI can, like a like a blue garbage bin. That's okay, behind, okay. Like, you know, like where else would you hide and smoke? Sure, sure. Years old. It's like, man, we can't be seen, right? Like people are already <laughs> already looking at us like we're into some some hood shit because we got like we're skateboarders, so we're oh, already sure. like we're already on the list, you know. And and skateboarding is illegal at this time. Oh my oh. goodness, you punk! That's, You're that's already being it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's where that skateboarding sticker, skateboarding. It, skateboarding is not illegal or whatever came from so it was illegal at this time you, you could get tickets if they saw you put your wheels down on the pavement wow. Wow. and so we're hiding you know we're hiding we're smoking this joint imagine being turned on that way like the environment like next to a stinky ass yeah I can way before they isolated food from garbage <laughs> so all of that shit is in there and sure you know we're smoking this pinner puffing it down and I, I just remember like you know kind of kind of getting back on our skateboards and jumping on a on a bus for whatever reason i think we were going to go to the chornik bowl which normally we would have skateboarded to but i guess we were stoned at that time so for whatever reason we got on a bus and then giggling and all this sort of thing ensued but i mean sure. really you know the vibe that was set in for us after smoking that joint was so beautifully shown by Chappelle in the movie half baked when him and his little 13 and 14 year old buddies go and get baked and uh-huh. he says that he says the infamous line, Abba Zabba, you my only friend. <laughs> yes. uh, it was very much like that without the Abba Zabba. Like it was like when he's like, oh, I fell in love. Mary Jane. Mary Jane. <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was kind of like that for me. I was like, you know what? I'm getting into this. Oh, this cool. Is, this, is, this is the next thing I'm getting into. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. It's, uh, yeah, it's lasted 33 years. There you go. There you go. Never a break. 
Uh, I've had little breaks, you know, like a month here, a month there. I don't think really much else other than that. Usually, you know, someone trying to like, you know, like, oh, you're addicted. It's like, no, I'm not. I could stop easily for a month. You know, I think I took 60 days off one time, just cold turkey. Just the only thing I really noticed was I didn't sleep quite as deep mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't have quite as much of an appetite. I'm a pretty skinny guy. I'm not really super food motivated. Sure. Um, and so cannabis helps regulate my appetite in a way where I'm, you know, as long as I'm working and, and doing, it allows me to eat a nice big meal and, and not to, you know, not stay too skinny, but not get fat either. So there you go. There you go. So yeah. it, many values we've had. There's another one we can add to the list, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, hash. <clears throat> yeah. When did you first discover your love for hash? How did that come about? Well, you know, I think at a very young age, I realized that I was I was taking this shit a little bit more seriously than my friends. And just the way, right off the bat, the way I smelt herb wasn't the way everyone else around me smelled herb. I was literally, you know, like a connoisseur from almost from day one. Okay. You know, just trying to find better. And then, of course, my mentor, Ron Hickey, who I got turned on to at a very young age, God, I must have still been a teenager. He was the real deal. He exposed me to, you know, quality and purity and uh, exceptional skills as, as, a, as a grower. And even as someone who, you know, I realized the grower back then wasn't just a grower. You were actually like a subcontractor. You need to have, you need to have contacts in the electrical world, in the For plumbing sure. world, uh -huh. in all of these different things from drywalling to all of it, right? You really needed to have all of those things wrapped up, trustworthy people involved in doing mm -hmm. them all and professionals doing them all. And, and he had sort of all that as well as just quality cannabis. So he had really allowed me to become the cannabis sommelier that I was naturally sort of finding myself in that situation. And from a very young age, people, Oh yeah, Mark's always got the best stuff, you know, like, oh, you gotta, you smoke with him, it's gonna be different then. And so I really, like, held that through right up until today, really. It's like, a nice I badge. Tried, yeah, I just, I, I love having the best quality, and so hash naturally came to me when I hit the ceiling that Herb created for me. <laughs> and it was fairly early that I hit the ceiling, and I was like, oh, like, there's gotta be something like... I can't just smoke like a hundred joints a day. Like it's ins <laughs> it's insane. I mean, I could and I did. Sure, it was sure. not. It wasn't like an ideal situation. It was just so much smoke and so much paper and so much glue and so much stuff that really wasn't the medicine that I was so obsessed with. It took me a while to figure that out, but eventually, you know, I got turned on to oils uh, probably first and didn't really like them. I found back then, especially, they were just like kind of just like shady dudes making oil back then that you could even like meet up with. They were like garage chemists or whatever. They butane kind of oils or? They, they were, no, this was way before butane was released. That was in the, the late nineties that Indra released the butane method. So this would have been in the eighties. Okay. And so it would have been like, you know, just nasty, like nasty, you know, naphtha oils and I, just yeah. nasty, Oof. nasty shit. Yeah, yeah, really bad, really wrong. <laughs> Just like any solvent, you could distill that. Oh, absolutely. And what they call rust inhibitors that they put in there for the meth, you know, so meth people don't buy that as a as oh a as a, a solvent to use for extraction, even though they still do it. But it's the it, the butane was the same way. It had all sorts of contaminants that were heavy metal, mm -hmm. that were like mercapatines and these other things that were present, and people unwittingly were concentrating them into their oils. Uh, it's pretty much all the solvents. It's certainly not just naphtha or iso or butane. It's it's they were all like that. But I just didn't gravitate towards it. I found it sketchy, and the oil guys were just like not really my people back then. Sure. I was I more gravitated towards hash. So then I started seeing like Afghan hash and Moroccan hash, and really the first hash that I actually liked I probably saw was Lebanese. Uh, blonde and red both early and late and then the real stuff that was like the, the creme to the creme would have been either the Nepali finger rub or Jamaican rub which was actually substantially like it was strong and so we got all these different hashes flowing through Winnipeg Manitoba where I grew up in, in the in the 80s and part of the 90s and so that sort of led me to that but then in 95 I went to the Cannabis Cup and I had actually met um, no, I hadn't actually met Rob. This would have been the first time I met Rob. Um, 95, I went to the Cannabis Cup. I had a booth uh, with my partners in Manitoba. And we had a bunch of hemp stuff. And we ended up meeting a bunch of cool people. I, I, when I got to my booth that day, Ed Rosenthal was sitting on it. You know, this guy just wow. sitting with a little, little pipe. This 
you know, he's like, I'm like, hey, what are you doing? You know, you're on my booth. He's like, I'm smoking hash. And I'm like, oh, I guess, I guess I'm, I guess I'm joining you. And it was what? like, I've been, I've been friend, friends with Ed for like 20, 25 years since that happened, basically. Oh, that's that's great. great. I had a great relationship with him. And so we were next door to Jack Hare with his granddaughter. Goodness. On the other side was Eagle Bill, the, 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 the famous vaporizer, Eagle Bill guy. And he was an amazing character. So. You know, we just sort of rolled in, made all these amazing connections. Um, where, where was I going with the... You were meeting Rob. Oh, that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right. So then, then I'm at this bizarre Thai food restaurant that was in um, on the back side of the dam rack behind the greenhouse off the dam rack. And it was uh, it was all ladyboys uh, or katoys as they were known, known as in Thailand. So basically, you know, it was before the word transgender, really, but they were, they were known as ladyboys. And all of the, um, the um, waitresses were, were these ladyboys at this restaurant. So apparently it was the best Thai food in Amsterdam, and Rob had lived there for years. So we ended up there. I ended up there with my lawyer, um, as well as with, um, with Rob and a few other people. Well, we're on the stairs to this restaurant. It's a super bizarro scene of ladyboys. Seems Thai like it. With high heels. <laughs> with high heels on, I was like, this is super trippy. And he's got this Ruhr bong and he loads it up with some hash and he, and he lights it and he says, if it don't bubble, it ain't worth the trouble. And that was the first time I'd ever heard that. When he lit the hash, it like bubbled and boiled and melted and then dripped through the screen and I got the most incredible hit I'd ever gotten. Well, I didn't know it at the time what hash that was, you know, the infamous, you know, secret dry sift. Mm. Um, but that was the first time I hit it. And I, I was on a mission from that time on. And it wasn't until 1998 that I actually created my own melty hash, which then, you know, very few months later turned into the bubble bag company, March of 1999. And I was like, I'm going to show everyone how to do this. Cause oh, this yes. is crazy that people know how to do this. And I don't know how to do this. So the minute I learned, I just felt this immediate urge to show everyone, like everyone. I was obsessed with it. And it was, uh, it was some of the favorite years of my life it was from 99 to about 2004 or five, when I really went to all the cannabis cups in Amsterdam. And I went to all these amazing events in Germany and Switzerland and Spain and London and just got to be the bubble man, you know, got to build this character that is the bubble man and always have this fire hash and just be showing people information that they didn't know. You know, now it's so second nature that people just take it for granted. But back then, showing people that was like giving them their first bicycle or teaching them how to read. It was a big deal. For sure. So it seems to me that there's a little window that there's a p missing piece of information and that's water where did where did water come into this mix i'm, I'm i mean i'm not saying necessarily that you were the you know uh the creator of the, the water no. being the carrier but where did that How come did you in that play in, yeah, and, and come that into that making of key. the bags all right so you know, I didn't know any, I'll tell you how I figured it out and then I'll tell you the true story of how it actually came to be. Because I ended up in a big lawsuit over this whole thing. Oh wow, course, cool. With, oh, wow. with, with Reinhard Dell, who I befriended in the end and we, we became good friends. And I, I think he's unfortunately since passed, so we'll say rest in peace to him. But so basically, and I was going to all the Cannabis Cups since 95. So in 98, I saw this new product. This, was, this would have been in like November. So right at the end of 98, mm -hmm. I saw a product called the Isolator Bags. Okay. Now these bags were a two bag system out of Amsterdam and everyone claimed that they were invented and created and sold by Mila. Well, I knew Mila. Mm -hmm. I was friends with Mila. I've been going to Amsterdam since 95, 95 and I knew all of them, you know, from Soma to, to Vernard to Mila. I, I, I knew the variety of, of, you know, Arian and Steve at the, at the, um, Oh, what the hell is it called? The, the gray area. There was, you know, Lucky Mothers. Like I knew Adam from TH, uh, from TH Seeds, which was before Hempworks, the CIA, Cannabis in Amsterdam, and the KGB, No Good Buds. And so I knew all these people. And so I went to see Mila in 1998. I was now living in British Columbia for several years. My good friend, Hillary Black, who was the founder of the BC Compassion Club, 
She was kind of in love at the time with Todd McCormick, who was putting up a big bro in Bel Air next door to Ronald Reagan and wanted her to come. <laughs> but he was kind of had all these other young hippie girls there watering plants. And she was kind of like, you know, I'm more like monogamous. I'm not really down with, you know. And so she ended up kind of, you know, I, I had just moved here and I was in 96. So I'd only been here for a couple of years. And in 97, she started floating this idea around that she wanted to start a, a, for, a type of dispensary you know, inspired by the corrals um, in California, uh, Valerie and Mike, and sort of, you know, just figure out something for Canada. And so it was either go live in the, in the Bel Air mansion with Todd or start something in Canada. So she decided to start something in Canada and she sort of circled the words medical and marijuana, two words that she really disliked. And she wrote down on a piece of paper, I remember it because she was in my living room when she did it, the word compassion and the word cannabis. And that was really the birthplace of the Cannabis Compassion Club. Like in her mind, it went to paper. And then over the course of the next few months, she would be able to tell the story better than anyone because sure. I was just a small part of it. But she really created this BC Compassion Club. I believed in everything she was doing. I thought it was super valiant, the way she was stepping away from a, 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 a you know, a, a, an upper middle class life mm -hmm. uh, in West Vancouver and living in East Vancouver and really living like a pauper and taking care of people who have me uh, mental illness, who have terminal diseases, who don't have homes, who are homeless, really taking care of the most vulnerable people in society. So I immediately tried to do as much good through my own business, which I was brokering at the time and I was very good at it. I would create as much generosity through that brokering for the Compassion Club as possible, whether it was donating pounds for Christmas so they could give eighths to all the members, nice. or whether it was just donating pounds for just, here's some weed, like sell it and pay some bills. Mm -hmm. um, so Hillary really kind of pulled that out in me. Um, and so what happened was I actually was driving home one night and I had like, I don't know, 16 and a half pounds of Compassion Club herb. They had someone drive their car right through the Compassion Club window oh, in goodness. like 98. And so they tried to steal the safe with 35 pounds of Renee in it. Creepers. And so, yeah, it was kind of crazy. Um, so she had asked me, do you mind taking the medicine home? Everything's not secure here right now. So I was like, yeah, no problem. But I ended up like, you know, just getting home late that night and going through a roadblock and getting popped. Oh. 16 and a half, 16 and a half pounds, six grand cash. Ah. It became a case here in Canada, Richardson versus Regina. It was the first Compassion Club case in Canada. And the judge ordered my money be given back. He ordered no fine, no Beautiful. time. Unfortunately, I was charged. And the reason for that is because anything over three kilos in Canada at the time held a maximum sentence of, of 25 years in prison. <sighs> Uh, it was never given, but because of that sentence, it allowed for um, the, the judge was, was hand tied. You, you weren't allowed to give, you weren't allowed to just dismiss it. You weren't allowed to, uh, you know, kind of be like, oh, okay, let's just, you know, throw this out. You uh -huh. had to actually still be charged. So I've since, you know, had that record expunged years and years ago because this was over 20 years ago. You can get it expunged after 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I have a clean record and whatnot, but that sort of happened. And when that happened, you know, I was suddenly like, wow, I need to do something here for business. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go see Mila in Amsterdam and I'm going to see if I can't be the salesperson for isolators in Canada. Sure. And I went and I went to see Mila and for whatever, I, I swear to God, it happened because it needed to happen. Like it was my fate to create bubble bags. And I can tell you that because I had no intention on doing it at all. I just wanted to sell bags that uh -huh. already existed. Sounds like, so yeah. I, I went, I'm waiting I went for the... Amsterdam. Yeah, exactly. Just, you know, <laughs> they they kind of go on the easy route. And I went and I saw Mila, and it was the first fight I ever had with Mila. Oh, she goodness. got really mad at me. She called me a silly American, kind of kicked me out. <laughs> and I remember when I left, I was like, and by the way, I'm a silly Canadian. <laughs> you know? and, and so I, you know, and, and, and she wasn't being a horrible person. It was just for whatever reason, I think... You know, I rolled in pretty cock of the walkie. I was like, yeah, I want to buy like a thousand sets of isolator bags. I want to be the distributor for Canada. Well, at this point, she probably sold 16 sets. So it was, it, I didn't realize how I was coming across, but I shit you not, bro. I would have bought a thousand of those sure. kits. Like she just was like, thought I was insane and being an, an American. And so uh, I am, I'm a North American. What can I say? I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not too far off from my Southern brothers and sisters. Um, 
But it, it, I went home with my tail between my legs. I was pretty crushed. I was like, fuck. Yeah, I could that was, the, oppor- that was the opportunity to me. And my wife of now 31 years, my partner, uh, Charlene, who's been, always been very quiet and very shy and very reserved, an amazing mother. But in the business world, she's always been very quiet. She doesn't chime in much. And I get back all bummed out. And she just looks at me and she's like, so why can't we make our own? And I was just like, I never thought I, about it don't know <laughs> You're a genius. I was like why can't we make our own and I was like well I don't know how to sew and she's like well, get me a sewing machine I'll learn how to sew and so I went and bought a, a computer a sewing machine a digital camera it was the Sony Cybershot 2.1 the first silver one that had the lens that went like this uh-huh. 2.1 megapixel if you can imagine uh, that right? was the fire and it was $2,000 for that camera Holy cow! <laughs> and then I bought a bunch of nylon and some screen and some thread and we went to town and two houses over from the house I'm sitting in right now my wife sewed the first bubble bags that ever existed and so right off the bat I had a very good friend of mine years ago tell me you know because I, I, I went to him kind of for help and said you know is it is this bad business? Am I just copying a product? And he says, well, it's bad business if you copy it and you undercut it and you don't make it better. And I'm like, oh, so if I add innovation to it and I make it a more expensive product, that's not bad business. He's like, that's not bad business, man. That's what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. You know, just don't undercut that person's business. That's, that's, That's bad business. So I created right off the bat a three bag system and because I knew her bag was a 70 micron, the second bag, and I mm-hmm. knew from my own experiments in R&D that that was too small. And so that led for years for her saying that 25 micron hash was immature and, and, and broken heads. And it wasn't until years later at the Cannabis Cup when my friend Breeder Steve, who I had gone to Switzerland to Lugano to make a bunch of hash with, he showed up at the cup and he mixes with tobacco. So him and Mila get along really well. They like to smoke joints with tobacco. Sure. Mila likes to put a lot of tobacco with a little bit of hash. Steve likes to put a lot of hash with a little bit of tobacco. So he's smoking a joint next to her at the High Times Cannabis Cup dinner that year. And she says, wow, that smells really good. And he says, yeah, do you want to trade? And so he gives her his joint and he (laughs) smokes her joint. Well, halfway through, because Steve knew that she'd been calling 25 micron hash like bunk. It was Uh one of the reasons she said I didn't know what I was talking about. Well, halfway through the joint, she got super high and he said to her, you know, that's that's 25 micron hash. Uh-huh. And he was like, he was like, dude, she just kind of left after that. I was like, <laughs> but in, in her defense, she started selling 25 micron bags not too long after. Mm, so you know go. what? Sometimes we're stubborn and that's OK. We learn from each other. You know, I thought for years that I had ripped her off. Everyone called me a thief. I had everyone from her group thinking I was this horrible thief. In fact, her daughter approached me one day at an event in Germany and said, I need to talk to you because these stories absolutely can't be true. They've just gotten too out of hand. You can't be that evil. So I talked to her for a couple hours and we actually got along really well. And it was a good sort of kind of break in for our two groups. Um, But in the end, I found out when I got um, sued by Reinhard Delp for the water extraction patents that he held, I learned that in 1997, he came out with a machine called the Ice Cold Extractor, uh, and it was like a metal kind of brewer's drum, five gallon, and he was mixing in it, and then what he was allowing were all the heads to settle down in maturity rates, and he'd open a little valve and let that out into a, a, a flask that would catch the levels, and then that's how he would filter through a coffee filter. He didn't believe, he didn't under, he never really saw the, the, the sense of the bags the way I did it. Sure. So, and, and I never invented the bags, and Mila never invented the bags. In fact, a mutual friend of ours named Eldon, who was an old hash smuggler who used to travel around India and Nepal and, and spend a lot of time in, in Amsterdam, he invented the bags. And so Mila had just signed a contract with this guy, Reinhardt, to sell this ice cold extractor. Well, Eldon's sitting on the couch one day while she's showing them how it works. The other guy on the couch is Mark Rose, who's currently my manufacturer and has been for almost 20 years. They're looking at this thing and Eldon says, two nylon bags with screen bottoms uh, and a five gallon bucket and you got the same thing. Mark Rose immediately goes, we're isolating. It's the isolator, isolator. So he names it and manufactures it. Eldon invents it. Mila sells it and that's her part that was a very important part she absolutely brought that to public but it's important that people know the history of the other people who were extremely important which were Reinhardt 
Eldon, and Mark Rose, all of whom I've had relationships with. When I went through my, my lawsuit with Reinhardt, I ended up paying him out six figures on uh, his patent for bubble bags for the entire existence of the, com of the company's existence. So I was the, one of the only companies. Um, payload bags was another one. They paid as well. We were one of two or three companies total that ever paid that man any money. And to have been called a thief for 10 to 15 years by someone that had legitimately thiefed it. And unfortunately for Eldon, he was never paid any percentage. He was, oh, he was supposed to be given 5% of the bag sales. So what happened was eventually she started getting those bags made by Turkish uh, people locally. My manufacturer, who wasn't my manufacturer at the time, discovered this. And he felt like he was about to get squeezed out. He knew he was. So he contacted me on the internet, brought me to Amsterdam, and we made a deal that he would become the manufacturer for bubble bags. And I've stood by that guy for almost 20 years. I've never had a single bag made anywhere else. And you know, business can be cutthroat and there's all sorts of people who say the only way to gain you know, forwardness in business is to, is to be cutthroat. It's just not true. You can do good business, you can be loyal, uh, and your name it becomes what you are over the course of your 10, 20, 30 years. And so that's what led to bubble bags being created. You know, all of those things bubbling up kind of at the same time, me being busted, my wife stepping up to the plate and saying, why don't we make our own? Mila having a bad day, Reinhardt inventing the ice cold extractor, Eldon coming up with the bag idea, Mark Rose manufacturing them. A lot of people deserve a ring in the ladder and it's why I never take credit for any of it. All I did was get to be the lucky guy who got to bring it to people for through sure. the internet and I couldn't have done it without that whole list of people <sighs> including Mila. That's precisely why I asked that question. That's, that was a beautiful answer. Thank you. Yeah, Appreciate and that, that kind of brings us all the way around to, you know, bringing it to people on the internet. Can you tell us some more about Hash Church? How did that start? When did that start? And was that the first way you shared on the internet or did you do videos and such beforehand? Well, you know, the first thing I ever did on the on the internet really, which wasn't videos. It, well, I did I did a video with Mark Emery on Pot TV back in 99. It was I, I was not Bubble Man yet, I was actually Tripper. And my friend Barge, who eventually went by the name Tricomb Farmer, um, it was Barge and Tripper and we went and we made a batch and we did this whole video and it, it worked out really well. But prior to that, I could feel the internet bubbling in 1999. Breeder Steve, once again, gotta give him credit. He came to me and said, hey, why aren't you on Overgrow? I'm in the Shark Tank, come hang out. Little did I know the Shark Tank was where all the trolls went. I didn't realize <laughs> Steve himself was an internet troll and loved to just fuck with people. Uh, but he did, and he is, and that's what he, he wanted to do. And, and But he brought me to Overgrow, and I ended up meeting Shebang and becoming, I created the first hash forum that was on that forum, as well as Cannabis Culture and all the other ones that copied soon after. There was no hash forums. And that's where I met guys like High Grade, who became one of my first customers. He was famous for his bubbler buckets. I met Bushy Older Grower, back in the day there selling seeds. I met Gypsy Nirvana, a whole host of incredible people. Uh, helped you know try to steer the ship and, and moderate the hash forums. That was really my first play at um, education. Always hung out in the cannabis chats, whether it was the, you know, Steppenwolf had uh, oh, True Stoners back in the day. That was in the early 2000s where I first met Jack and Jill, who would end up becoming divorced, and Jill would end up with Sub, and that's how I met Sub. And so all of these sort of things, I was always a part of it. I ended up having Full Melt Bubble for a while, which was my own educational website. I still have it, but it's not super active. And then Hash Church really sort of spawned up um, spur of the moment. I was starting at 2005, I started my YouTube channel, but it wasn't until really 2014 that I decided I was going to put energy into it and start making videos and start building an audience. And so I started creating milestones in 2014. And one of the milestones I created after, I don't know what it was, 5 million views or whatever, you could, you could live stream. <laughs> and I was like, well, and it was eight in the morning on a Saturday, mm -hmm. on a Sunday morning. And I was like, live stream. I'm like, what the hell is this? I'm like, okay. So I, I just go through it all. I'm like, well, I might as well try it. And then they're like, what's the name of the show? And I'm like, oh, I'll call it Hash Church on Sundays when I had my gallery in the early 2000s. Across from my gallery was a good friend of mine by the name of Amir, and Amir okay. had started a restaurant called Rhyme, which was his name backwards. 
<coughs> he was a big puffer, and I didn't know it at the time, but he only actually opened his restaurant because my gallery, The Melting Point, was right across the street. Mm -hmm. There's a whole, we could talk about that gallery for an hour, some incredible shit, including the regenerate art and the degenerate art glass show with Marble Slinger happened at that gallery. Oh, wow. It was, a, it was amazing, as well as two Legends of Hash parties. So we used to go over to this guy's restaurant on Sundays, and we'd call it Hash Church, or we'd call it Church, actually. So that morning on Sunday at 8.30, by the time I'd gotten through all of those different rules and you know things to click, I finally named the show. <laughs> I think I called it Hash Church, uh, a, a morning Hash Church or something. And then I invited random people from my social media. So if you go and look at the first Hash Church, it's super randos. Be like, kind just of funny, talking. right? And so slowly but surely, it took like only three or four episodes to realize you might have something here that's special. And all of a sudden I was like, holy shit, I know a lot of people in the industry. And there's, there's, you know, there's, there's gotta be something better than just being like, oh, I know him, I know him, I know her. Why not start reaching out to those people and saying, hey, will you come to this platform? I wanna make my traction more about all of us than just me. You know, because I had some good traction going. I was starting to build. That show ended up with a thousand live viewers, over a Beautiful. thousand live viewers Beautiful. every Sunday when we went live. So, and I was obsessive with it. It started as a total rando, and like 267 episodes later, I had never <laughs> missed a Sunday. Like I'm telling you, I had some crazy experiences, like flying into Pearson's Ontario Air in Toronto Airport, jumping off the plane with my Rastafarian partners, jumping in a car and driving through a snowstorm with Rastafarians driving the car. Right to get to Brampton, Ontario before nine o'clock so I could start Hash Church <laughs> and seriously stressing about it. The like, love. No joke. Yeah. The stressing love. about it, bro. My wife was just like, are you fucking insane? Like, <laughs> seriously, like, why are you doing this? Like, I don't even understand. It. I, was like, I was like, it's bigger than me. Like, it's, yep. it's bigger than me. I can't, I can't even explain it. It's a huge It's just gotta happen. It's just gotta, gotta happen. happen. Gotta happen. It's gotta happen. Gotta yeah. happen. Have there been any panel members that have been there since the very early episodes that are still on their panel? Oh yeah, Etienne Fontaine is one of the original panel members. Dr. Mark Skeldone is one of the original panel members. Uh, Skunkman Sam is one of the original panel members. John Burfello is one of the original panel members. I mean, a lot yeah. of them are still OGs. The That's fact that it's like that is, says a lot, honestly. Mm -hmm. That, that people have hung around long enough, that value the show long enough, that have so much respect for the show that they stick around that long. And that there's still information to share <laughs> about Hash. It's amazing. Yeah, and it's ever, you know, we didn't realize it, but two years into that show, we really had a profound effect. Everyone that was on that panel had a profound effect on steering the community. And we didn't really realize it at the time when we were just like, you know, had... You know, uh, soil grown. Come on and talk about rosin making. We're like, hey, we, we're here. You're making rosin out of flowers and stuff. Let's talk about that. There was no single company making rosin presses. Do you realize like multiple companies were formed like a week or less after that rosin press? And now flourish. Episode. Yeah, and now flourish, dude. Like just selling screens alone, they're in crush mode. Let mm -hmm. alone all the machines, and it's a whole new part of the industry, which you know, coincidentally is symbiotic with the part of the industry that I've always thrived in, which is the hash part of the industry. So bubble bags and rosin presses kind of go together like peanut butter and uh, jam. They do. They do, actually. And that's that, that that's what gets me smiling is talking about the rosin. <laughs> so let's let's talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, we've got hash and we've got rosin, um, two distinctly different things. Yeah. Um, what, what, I mean, besides soil grown, and maybe that is the thing, soil grown solventless, but what, um, what turned you on to rosin? And, and I see you now, um, I, I mean, for a while wa watching Hash Church, I almost felt like as a rosin extractor, like I was ruining the thing that you guys, you know, love so much. You know, I'm taking the hash and I'm putting it in a bag. And I'm smashing it out, and I'm pulling the re extracting the oils from that. So for a long time, I felt like, like literally, like I was just ruining the thing that you guys cherish so much. So, so walk me into that. How did you, you know, become to realize that 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 rosin is a good thing, that it can be a good thing, that it's valuable, and the differences, and 
I'll, I'll take, let well, you go at, from there. At, at, at that point, I had already understood and realized that solvent extracts were important for people to have access to, that your own ego is not the only thing that rules the universe, and the sun doesn't actually evolve around you, it <laughs> evolves around the, the planet that you just happen to be on, and sometimes people forget that. So I would fight for every modality. I would fight for people to have access in every modality of hash and oil making, I just do differentiate oil from hash. Sure. And so I, when rosin came out, it was one of the first solventless oils. Now, prior to that, I was making my own solventless oil and thinking about things in regards to um, when I met Mark McCoy. Actually, at first it was Eagle Bill who had the gun, but eventually Mark McCoy from Vrip Tech showed me the Steinel gun with the ceramic core heater with no asbestos. And what we would do is we'd blast the herb over a glass you know, vial and it would end up condensing red oil in the stem. Well, when we changed and I started using a volatizer and a quartz bowl and stem, I noticed that the quartz preserved the terpenes and the cannabinoids differently and the precipitate turned gold instead of red. And so then I was like, whoa, that's, I'm actually making solventless dabs. And so I would hit, you know, a bunch of vapor rips and then I would scoop out a solventless dab out of this. This was in like 2003, you know, 2002 even, like making solventless dabs. And I was thinking, what if we had a quartz dome that you stuffed with herb and then you just had heat guns, like 12 of them sticking into this thing, blasting and allowing it to condense down into a, a condenser with a, you know, whatever type of condenser you have where it's cold on the outside and that precipitate can turn back to liquid or solid from, from vapor. And I was thinking about this a long time ago. So when rosin finally came around, I immediately embraced it as what, for what it was. I loved it. I, on one side, I was a little bit sad because I had seen butane. You know, I wasn't against people taking butane and, and making a, a beautiful extract with it. What I was mostly against was young, ignorant people concentrating poisons into oils and selling it at medicines, young, ignorant people blowing up and harming themselves mm -hmm. and others, and just kind of, you know, being led down a path where you got some material and you ran it through your bubble bags and it came out like sand and it wasn't sticky and you're like, what's wrong with my, my bubble? Why doesn't it melt? It's like, oh, because your, your herb is swag. You yeah. need to grow better <laughs> herb. Well, they didn't want to they didn't, they didn't hear it's that. It's a hard thing a to say. Yeah. If you can take that Gordon Ramsay advice, and go into it, well then you grow exceptional herb, herb within three to five years. <laughs> if you take the left road, which is like, well, if I put this shit into butane, it's coming out gold and delicious anyway. Mm -hmm. What do I care, you know, what the actual quantity is? So I had much more respect for the butane guys that were taking top quality material and blasting yeah. that than the guys that were just turning shit into shit that looked like better than shit. Mm -hmm. And I saw that with <laughs> rosin happen almost immediately too. I was like, guys, like when you run material through your bag, because that's what rosin turned into. Save your hash that's not dabbable. And I think that's amazing. I don't, I think it's amazing, but it, it worries me in, in the sense, like the same way these guys that come out with these giant dryers that take away powdery mildew using microwave frequencies or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Hey, don't worry about your micro, uh, about your moldy mids. You know, just keep growing them that way, bring them to us and we'll make it sellable. I worry about technology like that because it's stifling quality growth. Agreed. Agreed. And so, but at the same time, everyone has their own lesson and their own their own mission, and everyone has their own level that they're going to stop at. So, I deeply appreciate rosin, and uh, everyone's love for it is great. Now, unless you're squishing something that has a ninety five percent return, you're not squishing what I love. So, don't feel bad about it. <laughs> Good deal. Good. <laughs> yeah, usually I'm in the I'm in the eighty eighty five. So. So, I, you know, I, and I've always thought about that before, you know, I've, I've, I've said, before, you know, my hash is dabbable, um, but it's not, it's not an, as clean of an oil as dabbing rosin, yeah. you know, and that's just what I prefer, I guess. But uh, um, on, on that note, what, what do you prefer, I guess, um, hash and or rosin? And then on that same note, um, to expand it, when smoking the two or either or, how do you prefer smoking it? I dab them both. I dab everything. I don't really smoke anything these days other than just through vaporization. Um, I love them both. I definitely have always felt like rosin is, is more of a dessert for me. And I, I've always sort of chalked that up to, you know, the part that we leave behind, which is the laboratory where the cannabinoids are synthesized inside the plant, inside those glandular trichome heads is that little laboratory, that little fibrous mat 
that's going to funnel in those precursors from the organelles that are producing plastids and vacuoles, which produce phenols and hydrocarbons. Those are the building blocks of cannabinoids. Those are getting mixed into this, this fibrous mat and with the help of UV light and probably a lot of things that we're not even privy to, the plant starts producing CBGA and eventually from there it produces the entire terpene and the entire cannabinoid profile. And so for me, having that mat present in my hash is what I call the six course dinner. It's just full. It, I don't know how to explain it any other way, but when I hit rosin, it's not to say it can't get me just as lit. It's just not as, it doesn't have the depth that I get from, and that's probably more than anything I would suspect because our preferences have to be rooted in our own cognitive dissonance and the connection that we have with the relationships that we've had with these substances, you know, whether you, oh, I used to smoke this and go see the Grateful Dead, or I used to, you know, it sure. can connect for different reasons and it just makes that a more fuller, better experience. So who's to say if I started hitting rosin or bubble, you know, full melt bubble just in the last three or four years, I might not have that same mentality. But bubble for me was the first thing that removed the ceiling completely from cannabis. And I never found a ceiling with bubble, not six star. When I smoked six star bubble, I could get as uncomfortably high as I wanted it's to. And even when I thought I was as uncomfortable as I could be, I could actually make myself more uncomfortable. <laughs> Beautiful. I love that there's no ceiling there, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so travel. You've been some places. Yeah. <laughs> um, a couple places that stick out in your mind first of all we'll start there uh well one of my favorite places i've ever traveled to was india you know i was going to a lot of fish shows at the time and i think in 98 or something fish uh, trey was he was saying some shit in vegas he was telling everyone to go get a life it's like look it's great that you want to follow us but holy shit like go do something yeah. which was kind of hilarious <laughs> i was like i was feeling it i wasn't at the show but i heard the bootleg and I was feeling it. I was kind of like, you know what? I'm feeling it. <coughs> so I decided I was going to go find an amazing festival somewhere in the world. Something that wasn't the Burning Man. Something that wasn't some mainstream festival. So what I found was the Maha Kumbha Mela in India. It's been happening for thousands and thousands of years. <coughs> it happens every three years in one different city. Okay. Starting in uh, um, Haridwar, Alabad. Jaipur and Varnasi. Those are the four holy cities that the that the the Kumbh Mela happens in. Every three years you get a Kumbh Mela. Every twelve years you get a Maha Kumbh Mela. And every hundred and forty four years you get a Maha Maha Kumbh Mela. Okay. So these motherfuckers have like investment into this festival. <laughs> right? Yeah. You can't believe it. <laughs> Millions of people like pilgrimage, like a true pilgrimage. They're not like jumping in cars and on planes. They're pilgrimaging to this little, you know town in the foothills of the Himalayas where there's a Shivite temple up on the hill above uh, surrounded uh, in monkeys. It's incredible. Goodness. So I had never been to India before. My partner at the time had been traveling for about 10 years to India. So I was like feeling pretty comfortable. Let's go to the let's go to the Kumbh Mela. I'll fly to Delhi. We'll take the train up to Haridwar and we'll we'll have, uh, you know, an experience. So that was maybe the first time I had ever experienced true magic in the world. Um, just things that were impossible seemed to be possible there. And uh, yeah. yeah, it was amazing. I smoked a lot of chillums okay. with this Baba named Pashupati. Uh, and he was an amazing man that spoke, you know, 50 plus languages. He always knew what language you spoke. And he was just an incredible individual to spend some weeks puffing chillums on the side of the Ganges with in Northern India. I bet that was an amazing yeah, so, experience. Yeah, right. Sounds interesting. I know a lot of um, people know that you've been to Jamaica a lot. When did you first go to Jamaica and why? I, I took uh, my girlfriend at the time in 1995. We'd been together for six years at that point. And I remember my uncle in Toronto when we stopped in Burlington. He was kind of like, you're not going to marry her, are you? And I was like, whoa, no, I'm just taking her there for her birthday. She's never, she'd never been out of the country. I, I want to take her somewhere for her birthday. 
But when I was there, I kind of got this urge to be like, you know what, maybe we should get married. And I asked her, and she was like, of course. Like, yeah, let's do this. Let's just elope. We don't need all the fancy dancy trappings. Let's just get married on a beach in Jamaica with two, uh, two uh, witnesses. So that was in 1995. We were, God, 23 or 24 years old or something. Um, we ended up getting married there and we were staying in a tent at the time. We were actually ca like camping in Jamaica. It's something you don't really wow. hear people doing nowadays. Uh, people told me it was dangerous. I didn't believe them and it wasn't. Jamaica was amazing. The people were amazing. That was the beginning of my connection with, with the country actually. So I went back a few times, but the, the main time I went back would have been in 2000 when I brought bubble bags and I brought, you know, I went to see Junior in uh, Orange Hill and I went and saw Ziggy in Orange Hill who happened to be the two guys to win first and second place hash making at the Jamaican High Times Cannabis Cup like 20 years later. Wow. You know, like, and they, and they both walked off stage <laughs> and gave me a, a big hug. I was standing there, I was like, oh my God. And then, and then after they won, I won for best product. And it was just so neat to be up on stage and see them both in the audience with their cups. Like surreal. That's super and cool. I was just like, yeah. So I, you know, in 2000, I rolled into Jamaica. I gave away thousands of dollars in bubble bags. You know, I, I wasn't going to be able to charge them hundreds of dollars for these bags. Sure. So I really just gave them all away, gave them the information. And it created, it locked me into a relationship with I those bet. people that, have never, that has never gone away. It's just been such a strong, like... They're just amazing, amazing people. And uh, if you just offer sometimes the smallest, just just honesty and to escape from the hustle that they're constantly trapped in. Because, you know, like one of the number one industries in Jamaica, one of the main industries, if you're Jamaican, is the tourist industry. Sure. So you immediately have to figure out ways to hustle tourists to be able to make any of that little money because there's not a lot of other business in the, in the industry, in the, in the country and the business that is there they don't pay very well, you know, like someone that works at a hotel in Jamaica might pay 10 US dollars a day, but a can of Coke is still like a dollar 83. Goodness. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So, That's harsh. you know, that, that, you know, what, the, the bubble relationship really sealed the deal. Then starting the company there in 2014, 2015, when we started CRD and I met Subby, uh, my partner and all of those guys, then it was even just more connected than I'd ever been like really truly deeply connected to this wonderful group of people like the Richie Spice the artists and you know Subby my partner and like all of them it just my wife said it years ago to me she said I figured it out I know why you like Jamaica so much and I was like why and she's like because you are Jamaican <laughs> and, 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 and my Jamaican uh, partners and friends were 100% in agreement they're like yes mom yes <laughs> I was like, all right. I love it. Make you feel good. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I love that country. I love the people. I love the culture. I love the food. I love the music. Um, I always want Jamaica to have opportunities. And uh, I think it would be a, a real shame for Jamaica not to be able to gain from an international play in the world of cannabis as a recreational smoke. Because Jamaican herb, you know, that sun-grown herb, it really is, there, there's something special about it. I can imagine very special. Yeah, it's one of the only countries. Sorry, it is the only country. Here's some geography uh, um, um, information for you. It is the only country in the Caribbean that is 100% fully surrounded by the Caribbean Sea. All right. All of the other ones are on the outskirts and have different bodies of water hmm. around their backs. Speak about terroir. So, so it's the yeah, heart it, it, of the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, exactly. It's the heart of the Caribbean, and it is indeed. That's also what I would say. The terroir mm -hmm. of that environment mm -hmm. has is not to be replicated anywhere else in the Caribbean. That's amazing. Kind of reminiscent, reminiscent uh, somewhat of, of like the Emerald Triangle, you know. That's totally. just, just another place that uh, kind of, you know, and there's, and there's a multitude of places that in, like that in, in the world that, uh, but that's what makes them special, you know. Um, so in your travels and in hash, what what countries stand out? I, you know, I had originally we had originally I think Dizzy had actually written it down. What was the where's the best country that produces the best hash? And that may be hard to tie down, but maybe the top, the top three. three. <laughs> and why? 
Well, that's easy. The top three will be the three countries that export the least amount right off the bat. Um, now that's probably not accurate anymore. So it really depends on the time because now I have friends growing in Morocco that grow fire as fire as anything you could grow anywhere. You know, they brought the right cultivars, they're doing it right, they're giving it the right nutrients, they're giving it the right amount of water, and the sun is obviously not a problem. So, I mean, for me, I would probably say Nepal, Jamaica, and Lebanon. And that's just because my experience is of where I found the best hash. I couldn't just say, oh, all the, I used to shit on Moroccan hash all the time. I had no love for it whatsoever. I was not a big fan of it. And um, I basically, I just wasn't a big fan of it. And so it wasn't until my friend, uh, and I won't even say his name because he wouldn't like me to, um, he put some in my hand and it was like, what is this? This is like the nicest, most beautiful hash you've ever seen. Like the highest, a 10 out of 10 bubble oh. or a 10 out of 10 dry sift. Oh. And he was just like, yeah, it's just, it's the stuff I'm growing and making in Morocco. And so that now all bets are off in that sense. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's no longer connected. But for me, prior to that, I'd never seen Moroccan hash that I liked, and I wasn't a big fan of Afghani hash. But I had seen Lebanese hash, both red and blonde, that I did have an appreciation for. And I found that the gum from Jamaica was by far the strongest uh, of, of any of it. The Nepali was, was we, it seemed strong, but it's because we were putting a gram and a half at a time in a chillum and lighting that thing like, you know, you'd get a head rush. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Sounds like it. But... But the Jamaican gum, you could just smoke a little bowl of and it would even like bubble up and stuff. So that that was more like no joke hash. Um, the wife, you've 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 touched a little bit um, on her, you know, being in the business, but being behind the business. Um, uh, what what does she do in the business? Where's where, where's that? Well, my wife uh, actually focuses a lot more on the family. She's the mother. So she's mothering. So that's a big part of the business. 24-7. Yeah, like for real. <laughs> she's probably done. She probably did 6,000 hours of breastfeeding between our three children, which is about four years of a full-time job Goodness with, no yeah. with, no with no vacation. That's just the breastfeeding she's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she's a champion. So, um, yeah, we've really kind of got a funny 1950s relationship in that sense. Like, I'm like, that's why when she was like, listen, why don't I make the bags? That was a crazy anomaly. That was like, I had to listen to her because I was like, uh, excuse me? But was that you that just said that? The funny she, part she about said, that is I had bags in 99 and it made me wonder. I'm like, did I have bags that potentially your wife sewed by hand? You could have. You could have, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Very, very likely. <laughs> and, and two doors down from where I'm living right now. So she's done key things like that throughout the um, our relationship. But in reality, like... I could never have my children, and this is not a judgment for anyone that's in a situation where they need to be doing this, but for me, I don't want a nanny to raise my kids. Sure. I want like, you know, and she's, she's we're really in, of the same mindset. So we kind of like have this old school 1950s thing going on, especially having been together for 31 years, where I'm just working and doing all of that. And she's, you know, working and doing the majority of this. And I come and I do whatever I can when I'm not working and on weekends, but really like, I couldn't do what I'm doing without her doing what she's doing Absolutely. because I, I can't, ha I, w I would have to raise, I would have to be doing everything that she's doing. I couldn't, there's no one I could pay to do the 20 jobs that she's doing. <laughs> understand that for sure yeah so like it's, she's like it's crazy obviously super supportive and does she also consume cannabis uh not the way i do we're complete and total opposites thank you uh we're, the, we're complete and total opposites so she's uh she'll use cbd yeah there she is there she is look at that quick little quick little shot of shot there you go Hi. hello nice to see you nice to meet you <laughs> and so she you know um Sorry, where, where were we again? Mm. We were asking if she was a smoker. As well. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, so she doesn't really smoke cannabis, but she definitely consumes CBD. Oh, so she likes the sort of anti anxietist you know, just mellow it out. And so she's a, a daily CBD uh, user. She's always worn hemp as we've been the um, Canadian distributor for Hemp Hoodlum for almost 20 years now. So we've also, mm -hmm. you know, we've, we wear it. She eats it, so hemp seeds, uh, hemp seed protein powders and hemp seed oils. 
uh, but not the way I do, really. We're, uh, we could not be more opposite in that sense. It's kind of, in almost every sense, actually. It's a beautiful thing. Yin and yang. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. I don't, mean, I don't need a bunch more yang for my yang things, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Was the rest of your family supportive of your choice to go into the cannabis business? Uh, like my mom and my dad type of thing? Yeah. You know what, I guess I would have to say they were, even though my mom, you know, worked for the police as a 911 operator and all her friends were vice cops and detectives and cops Goodness. and it was super like, don't do <laughs> cannabis type <laughs> vibes. My dad was a fireman and he was more like, I remember, I think I was 17 and I was kind of like, I'm going to do this. And he was like, pulled me aside. He said, listen, if you do this, you better do it smart because you don't want to end up in Stony, which was like one of the main prisons in Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And my dad being a fireman worked four days and had four days off. So like every fireman, he had a contracting business where he built fences and decks. And he got the, he got the contract in Stony Mountain to build the interior fence with, uh, with some maniacs helping him uh, build the fence and convicted <laughs> murderers. So he was like, I was in there, it's not good whatever you do because i'm this he was he was being serious sure. like it was a yeah. province where you could literally go to prison for getting caught with it so i sort of took that to heart and i was like okay so what if we come at this from a different angle what if i'm a hemp activist and what if i approach my government with my partners first we'll open a hemp store and we'll show like hemp paper and hemp fiber and hemp clothing and hemp everything and we won't sell bongs and we won't sell high times and we won't be associated with cannabis sure. use at all that was in like 92 bro Wow! Goodness. Like, can you imagine? Wow! Yeah, so we did. We we did that. Then we went to our um, our minister of finance, Harry Enns, and our minister of oh, what was the other one? Finance and I can't even remember. So we go there. These two guys are looking at us. We like reek like weed, have long hair, dreadlocks, <laughs> like totally potentiating our stereotype. Drove up in an orange Volkswagen van. <laughs> like, might as well had clown shoes on. No and, the, and the front of our document, our deck, if you will said the trillion dollar crop and i remember harry ends going <laughs> he's like guys guys i don't have time for this and i said then do me a favor just look at the first page and he opened the first page and we had photocopied a page out of jack harris book the emperor wears no clothes and it was a front page of 1937's popular mechanic and it said the billion dollar crop and it was the first time billion and dollar had ever been used in an economic statement printed and we had it and we gave it to our minister and we told him exactly the history of that statement and that that was a true popular mechanics article and that it was 1937 they used the term billion and we think trillion is an accurate term for today and he, he leaned back in his chair and he said okay you guys have my attention <laughs> and and nine months later we had a license to the first license in manitoba in over 73 years to grow hemp legally i remember seeing province. i remember seeing the picture of you long hair yeah, standing yeah. out in the field that's a great yeah, picture. Dude, it was, great it picture. was amazing. Way to amazing. advocate. Um, yeah. So commercially, let's jump forward. Um, now, I mean, you're involved in a lot of different things. Um, True. Maybe touch on them. And uh, yeah, maybe touch yeah, on what them. What are your current adventures? There's a lot. All right, well, let's touch on them. I guess... Really the main ones right now, obviously Fresh Headies, which I started in 1999, which is going to be 21 years old next year, which is pretty, or sorry, 22 years old next year. It's 21 mm -hmm. years old now. Super crazy. Wished I could have had a celebration for the 20th year of Fresh Headies. I would have loved to have thrown a Legends of Hash, but with COVID and everything that was sure. going on, it just wasn't to happen. Thank God I didn't plan that, actually. It would have been a nightmare. Yeah, no doubt. But um, so I am doing really three main projects. I consult for a company called Segra International. Segra is a tissue culture company that my friend Ian Davidson is one of the founders of. Uh, he used to run or Davidson Organics down in California. I think he still does own it, but I'm not sure he runs it. And he also was like, he grew for the Cookies family and DNA Genetics. He was one of those big 20, 40,000 square foot greenhouse growers for the, for the heady companies. So obviously growing like tens of thousands of kilos. Uh, every year um, he had a problem with his clone one year for one of the companies and he lost like millions of dollars in clones to this virus Goodness. that never attacked cannabis he had to take it to the university they were like this is totally fucked you know this virus has never attacked cannabis and they were kind of like why aren't you looking at tissue culture and that's when he started his sort of 
you know, you don't realize it as a cannabis farmer because we've been stuck in prohibition, but all clonally produced plants on commercial scale are done through tissue culture. Basically, so you can initiate those plants, which involves growing the tissue culture a little bit, cutting it, growing it, cutting it, growing it, cutting it, growing it. That takes about six months. And what happens is it outgrows the viruses, the pathogens, the viruses, the bacteria, the microbials that are present in that plant. It outgrows them. Each time you cut it, you get more and more of them out until after four or five times, they're all gone. And you've now initiated and cleaned that genetic. So now that you know, that contamination, that almost plant candida, if you will, fungus just growing within the in, in intercellular mm -hmm. structure sure. of the plant, slowing that plant down and never allowing it to really maximize its expressions in terpenes and cannabinoid profile. Poor growers blaming himself, kicking himself in the ass or the CEOs blaming the grower, but not really realizing, you know, getting all those things out first gives you a huge advantage. It's like being able to sleep the night before the game sure, versus right? staying staying up all night the night before the game. Right. And so uh, I've been helping those guys facilitate relationships. I'm really a, a strong proponent of the tissue culture model. I believe what they're doing is going to be extremely important for what we're doing in Canada at Embark, my extraction company. And I think of us both as uh, bookends on, on, you know, on all the different LPs and all the cannabis companies. We know that when we get something to extract, we'd be really happy to know that it came A, grown organically, uh, regenerative and sustainably if possible which really isn't at this point in time in our in our program in Canada but um, at least you know have it be uh, from tissue culture as well which now I know they've gotten that advantage the expression the percentages I'm not going to be dealing with an 11.7 I'm going to be dealing with a 25.6 for sure for sure so yeah you've got Embark then and uh Whistler Technologies is another one. So Segra is that one that we just talked about. And then Whistler Technologies, which is a company uh, that I'm a part of with uh, Daniel, uh, my partner and CEO of that company. He was the founder. He sort of started the concept. Uh, I came on about a year and a half later, maybe two years even, uh, and just started helping in regards to mostly with sales and relationships and goodwill, but also with, you know, putting my name on the equipment, I'm sure helped that company um, get known a little bit faster than they than they maybe would have. So, Just a little bit. Um, helping with innovation, working with the engineers to try and like steer and direct, you know, the right ice structure and the right, the right type of mixing and, and all of those sorts of things. So just helping where I can with those guys. And uh, of course we use that equipment at Embark. So Embark's my most important project. It's the one I give the most of my time to um, I'm in my lab from 7 a.m. till 3 to 4 p.m. every day. Okay. For the first three months, I was in there from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., sometimes even 8 and 9 Ouch. p.m. I was doing 12 and 15 hour shifts for like three months. I've just recently pulled back. I've got nine lab techs that I'm training. So we're pretty excited. It's, uh, it's going really well. And, uh, you know, I'm surprised at the quality that I'm seeing uh, in the industry. So. You know, I have to once again escape my own Instagram mentality of only what I like and being able to create and, and offer products to people that fall outside the scope of what I want, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for instance, I pressed the pre I, I posted the pressed hash the other day and, you know, I definitely had one friend, pri you know, like, oh, so that looks like mids. And I'm like, well, it's, you know, 45 <laughs> percent THC instead of like 70. It's not mids, but it's something that someone will love. and. You know, we pressed it up and, well, why wouldn't you clean it? Why wouldn't you clean it with uh, your method or whatever? And I'm like, well, because not all customers request that. So yeah. it's uh, it's good to be able to be involved in a situation where we can, you know, be making so many different kind of products, have so many different things going. And for me, it's an absolute dream come true to run, you know, the solventless uh, part of the lab. That's where my luck comes. So I, I, can, I can understand that for, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It would be really fulfilling. It's nice and, to be busy. And you're able to share your amazing medicine, you know, with people who need it. So that's incredible. Yeah, exactly. You know, at one point in time, it's good to you get in your neighborhood and then you expand to a few other neighborhoods and then you start expanding across the, your country. And then eventually you start going to other countries like those are all possibilities, you know. And so for us, we're going slow. We're scaling slow. And for me, I just don't want to sacrifice purity. But. I can only unveil what I'm, uh, what I'm given. I, I understand that too. How exciting, though! You definitely have a lot going on. 
I know that you've taken a little bit of a step back from Hash Church, um, and people are missing it. They want to know when it's coming back. <laughs> I've been itching to do a Hash Church for a while. I know I could bring a great group of people in. There's so many at this point in time. It's uh, it did take a lot. Like you guys can't imagine how many how much I had to organize that show. And it was like herding cats, all these like cannabis personalities. And, <laughs> and then it got crazy. It was like, I'm not coming back on that show unless you get rid of so-and-so. And I'm like, oh my God, now it's Drama. like, now I'm in high school. Or, oh, yeah. or sometimes I'm, I would accidentally, you know, not accidentally, maybe sometimes I want to mix it up and I'd hurt someone's feelings that they didn't get invited oh, that sure, day. Sure, sure. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like it, it really turned into a, a, a burden, I will say that, but I miss it. I would love for Hash Church to come back full force and hit it on all cylinders. And I would say that the next Hash Church will definitely happen before the end of September. Ooh. I'll get a I'll, I'll get a good one uh, going here in the near future. I almost pulled one together last Sunday, yesterday, but I kind of I forgot to send the email out on this on Saturday. Saturday's pretty last minute. But my crew is my crew. They're always like, sure, man, whatever. Let's do it. Man, make mm -hmm. sure you get to turn your notifications on. The link's in the yeah. comments down below, Don't down in the description that. below. <laughs> right? <laughs> Good deal. Well, um, oh, uh, classes. I think I've heard you you offer classes as well or have. Or... I do. I do. I do. I have classes. It's, um, what is it, Solventless Extraction Course. You can hit me up through my Instagram on BC Bubble Man. But in that um, BC Bubble Man, whatever you call that, it's like on the front page, like it's it's the links right on the front Perfect. page yep. of my of my Instagram. It's solventless extraction course, and it does uh, show up. Learn with Marcus. Hell yes, right there you So go. it's pretty reasonable. Yeah, it's a good little course. Lots of people have taken it. I've had we offer full refunds, and I think we've given three. And every time we're like, yeah, no problem, man. Like have a refund. Like it's okay. Like we're not I, we're not trying to stress people out. I just know that for the price, ninety nine percent of people have been pretty stoked with what they've received. And then there's always that one percent that's like, well, like this is just bullshit. This is like, this isn't, this is nothing new. And I'm like, well, no problem, man. We'll give you a refund. For some of, for some people out there that may not click on the button to get the information, what is the format? Do they have to show up in person? Is it video chat? How? What's no, that? it's all done through. It's all done through video. And there's a whole like twelve to fifteen videos that go through the course. I answer questions in the forum. You know, it's like direct access to me, like kind of not that you wouldn't have it anyway. If you hit me up on Instagram, I'll still give you some access. But I, I spend a lot of time with these people and on Instagram and stuff. I'm, And it sucks because I'm sure a lot of people think I'm a dick, but I do have a limit where when it turns in, when I can tell it's turning into like a, like, let's be friends. It's like, and it's just like banter now. It's no longer like, I'm just like very robotic on Instagram and just like, ask me your question and I'll give you your question. And if you say something nice to me, I'll write back, give thanks. But I don't, I don't have time to, it's hard. to get into like 136,000 friendships. I no, it's hard. Like it's, it sucks. And I do want to figure something out in the future where we can gather with the people that really want to be like, no, I want face to face time. It's like, all right, I'll figure out a, a cool gathering that we can go to. But Instagram, like it'll suck up. It'll steal my whole day if I let it. If I yes. turned on notifications, you would not believe what it sounds like. It's the most ridiculous <laughs> thing. You can't even, it's like, it's ridiculous. Just for like when you first, yeah, until the phone dies basically. It's like, I can't imagine like having notifications on for stuff like, like that. But I do answer all my private messages, if you can imagine. Yeah, you definitely answered me really quickly. I appreciate that very much, man. Um, so I know, I mean, no, no, we had you for an hour here. We're running over a little bit. Uh, Dizzy, do you have anything before we part here? Uh, I'm just excited to see Hash Church come back. It was really cool to sit down and just chat with you and hear some of your stories. You've definitely got an incredible history with this whole cannabis industry. And um, wow, just an honor to sit and chat with you today. Well, oh, thank you so much for the kind words, for sure. I appreciate both of you guys. I like your vibes. I'm happy to hang out and sit with you. And the honor was really all mine. I, uh, I, I needed to hang out and do a little little chat and dab. Well, I appreciate it, man, very much. Um, shameless plugs. Of course, I'll link it all below. Um, where can people find you? And, yeah, where can people find you? Well, people can find my products, Bubble Bags, and all of those, uh, you know, fun hash-making tools at Bubble Bag that's singular.com or freshheadies.com. That's two H's between fresh and H, headies. Um, me, I'm on Instagram at BC Bubble Man. I'm on Twitter at BC Bubble Man. I'm on YouTube at Bubble Man's World. 
and which is actually also youtube.com backslash bc bubble man it just shows up as oh, cool. uh, bubble man's world so yeah those are all the spots that you can pretty much find me uh, if you need to track me down i've got a ton of facebook um groups like the endocannabinoid system group and all things terpenes and the water extraction dryers technique and the water extraction hash makers group and what else do i got in there there's there's at least a few more there's a rosin tech group i i do so all of those spots if you're on facebook are, are good spots to link with me as well perfect perfect well, brother, I really appreciate it. Like I said at the beginning of the show, I look up to you as a hash maker and as a as a clearer of the way, you know, a, a maker of the path for us all. And I really appreciate it. Um, I see you, you know, innovating constantly, you know, for the last 20 or so, 20, 30 years. And uh, it's impressive and, and it's it's very inspiring to, to us here, you know, on a, on a, on a more of an entry level, getting those method sevens of real work out there. <laughs> the sun is, and, uh, <laughs> the sun is right in my eyes. Yeah, I see that. Shout, shout out to method sevens. Hell actually. yes, I uh, agree. Yeah, I've, uh, I'm rocking the resistant twos here and they are on point. Kicking it, kicking it. You aren't gonna go blind. <laughs> so as, as I was saying, uh, for us, you know, just coming more, more of just coming into the industry, uh, you're a big inspiration, um, you know, to, to just refining things. Uh, whether it be processes or or quality or, or or whatever it may be, man, just pushing pushing the envelope uh, is is what I've taken off of, of of you you in the cannabis industry. So I appreciate that very much. Awesome guys, well thanks so much. I uh, I appreciate you and everything you guys are doing. I uh, enjoy seeing your posts and hearing uh, hearing what you guys are up to, and it's always a joy to have you on church or hash talk or whatever the title of the show happens to be i just i just love the fact that you sound like a professional radio dj with <laughs> it's very soothing i appreciate it i've actually i get that comment quite often so i guess there's something to it maybe <laughs> guaranteed guaranteed yeah if, if you if you need a spot filled on the show uh, i think i was on once before i, w I would love to sit on uh it, it, it sometimes feel a little overshadowed but i love to be there so for sure yeah man for sure we'll make it happen awesome well thank you very much i appreciate it um i think that's about all i have yeah thanks for hanging out with us hi friends all right until next time stay hi friends awesome have a great one Bye. peace out